Uh, right, good evening everybody. Uh, good, good evening, evening good to uh, people in the room and good evening to uh, people on YouTube. Um, I'm Paul Banks and I'll introduce our speaker in just a second. Um, tonight's talk, um, it will, well I'll introduce him now probably actually. Uh, tonight's speak, uh, speaker is, uh, wait for it, uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Commander Finn Adam Unglund Janssen, MBE, FRI, FRIN. RN, uh, but we'll call him Adam for this evening. Indeed, thank you. So, uh, welcome Adam. Um, we've got people joining on uh, on uh, YouTube, so for the people on YouTube, if you want to ask a question, uh, use the uh, chat facility on YouTube and uh, we'll pick it up and relay your question. Uh, for people in the room, uh, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand in the normal way, uh, just to make sure that everybody gets your question particularly the remote audience, will probably repeat your question uh, just to make sure. Okay, right, uh, on to the presentation then. So tonight's talk um, by Adam is about the modernization of navigation uh, in, in the Royal Naval Navy from the 1960s, um, when uh, the norm was to use paper charts and open bridges and Oh, you feel the wet wind and the wet finger uh, to more modern electronic stuff, uh, particularly the uh, WECDIS -E system. We'll no doubt hear a bit more about that in a little while. So, basically, it's navigation in, in the Navy from the 1960s to the present day. Indeed. So, over to you, Adam. Paul, cool. many thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, I'm not sure who is uh, online through YouTube. I think it was 14 at the last count. And sorry, 17. Now 17 and 21 Ooh. people in the room. A very uh, august location to be providing this brief as we look at what, how do you move from using traditional navigation to digital? That's the reason why I provide a little bit of a historical perspective. For those who are present from the Royal Institute of Navigation, who I'm representing, I have to make an apology to the, to the team who are here in the room. Kathy was saying, Paul Bryans, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm John. John, I keep forgetting John Hasselbrun, who have been trying to get me to do this for about four years um, at a location. I seem to have been far too busy, and particularly once we entered the COVID era, it has been even more challenging. But very, very luckily, uh, that it's this location, and we finally got to this stage. Um, uh, we have a Norwegian in the room, Runa, who I've been introduced to. My name, I have a Norwegian background, or at least, and he'll probably kick me for it, my father was Norwegian Finnish, and so I'm a bit of a split personality, being a Viking from Devon, who still doesn't know whether he should be Norwegian or Finnish. Um, <laughs> I also say that I think I was born to navigate, and born to investigate and try and improve things, and it's probably why I'm still working in the Navy as lead of the Navigation School, trying to solve problems. Because as with any government organization, you can't solve every problem at once. I'll try to avoid talking too much about the carrier. It is you know, our latest, greatest beast. We had to delay bringing it into service. That brought actually some problems with which system it would have that I'll allude to earlier, but try not to dwell on it too much. But it is impressive whenever it is moving to and from Portsmouth, either the HMS Queen Elizabeth or HMS Prince of Wales. And I'll also talk about our simulation facilities, which helped build the navigation process for them in terms of the marks in, which has been talked about by David Goddard, who works with me at the school, um, but also they come and practice regularly uh, before taking her to sea. So on to the, uh, the meat of the presentation. That's the scope I'll be dealing with. I'll try and stick to those timings. If questions come in, and we have got an online channel from YouTube which might be typed in questions, if it is something urgent, I'm very happy to deal with it at the time, and maybe to go off onto a tangent or, or sidebar, but then perhaps take more questions at the end. Uh, on the risk that any embedded video might not have run, I do have a few videos, two or three, that we can run at the end rather than within the sequence. But if the subject did go in that direction, we might try and trigger it. So. It is about the modernization process we went through, which is about all of the training linked to the capability. But hopefully what you'll find is that actually, although we're using a different system, all of our training is still about robust process using terrestrial navigation. 
I'll also talk about the navigation school, and it's personal to my heart and anybody who served in the Navy. Um, we have had to move and change at times, and a link to that has almost at times been driven by the change of technology. Uh, that sort of takes us to where we are with the full mission bridge simulators that are in my school now, and then how we have how we deliver our training system at present. But the critical question to ask with any digital navigation, once you've moved in that direction, is if you're not using your natural senses to perceive what is going on around you and achieving situational awareness, do you not become too reliant upon a digital device? Hopefully you'll see that we in the Navy are not, but it is a risk to think about in whatever craft you navigate. So, starting with the sequence of modernization, um, this is actually a picture from D-Day, and it's, it's actually the gun direction platform, but it's, it sort of epitomizes the idea of an open bridge with a chart table, often with a tarpaulin cover to, to work on. The charts would have been ruined at times, but you had an immediate view and an immediate resource in front of you. Um, Latterly from that, through our ships, we were very reliant upon a paper chart, and in most of the ships we ended up with a rearward facing chart table with voice reporting of information to the operations room. <coughs> now in any war fighting, the fighting of the ship coming from the operations room has to have the relevant information. And actually, you know, the bridge had that position and the starting point was voice reporting of position. A few sensors that would help but basic plotting on a chart and passing that down to the system. We already had a robust system doctrine in the BR-45 series, which many of you hopefully will have seen. Um, we have through the Seaways publication in the latter years, uh, and with the help of Royal Institute of Navigation, published that for general use. And I, I think, as you'll see, I still think it remains a valid set of references. And I keep many of them on my bookshelf in the office and I'm quite proud of the fact that I managed to get, uh, not quite the pair, but a 1915 Volume 1 and 1909 Volume 2 of Seamanship, which includes the drill for landing a field gun from an open boat on a beach. <laughs> so we can think back to Mafeking and where that came from. Um, so let's do a parallel. Here in the Little Ship Club, yacht navigation was pretty similar. You might have a navigatorium or pilot berth area where you had access to a paper chart, needing to protect it more from the elements potentially. Basic sensors, perhaps as we move forward through the 60s, some early radio nav aids. And if I articulate that, I did, and I often say, um, I was talking to John earlier about Sea Scouts. I was in the Sea Scouts in Exeter, my early forays onto the accessory. Um, I learned much of my navigation skill there and even started teaching other people when starboard hand marks were black. Obviously the shift to IR are only happening in 1976 to 79. My first channel crossing in a Contessa 26 was on RDF. Um, actually though, those sort of sensors, they still have an application in emergency, in reversionary modes. But what doctrine, and uh, John and Paul Bryans were talking about liaison with the MCA, what doctrine is there now for navigating the small craft? What were we using? We've got our YA courses, that was mentioned just before coming in, of people doing Yacht Master. Those are, are good cuts, good systems for providing the training. But as we move forward into the digital era, what else will be needed? An example. Now, I have to apologize. I don't know the owner of this boat, but this is an online photograph. I didn't have any remnant photographs of the Contessa 26 I used to sail in but at least I can honor the name of the boat is uh, still listed as for sale at the moment. Echo Sounder up on the starboard bulkhead. Uh, very early sensors, and obviously a late modern addition to help it. But that's the basis of early navigation in yachts that many of you will probably recognize. In that period, moving from that sort of era of yacht, the Navy was already thinking of updating. And it covers quite a time span but that move from the 1960s, and I specifically choose 1981 for a reason, we were updating our doctrine, probably making it more robust and actually starting to demand that any ship going anywhere, there was a full set of safety bearings that would keep you off a planned limiting danger line right around the area 
you were navigating in, not just clearing bearings off a hazard. We would box in and still do all of our available safe water. The only real change in equipment came about through 1978. This is a cut from a, an edition of the New Scientist. You won't be able to read that. Uh, that segment there talks about what we were about to do. A digital, I call it digital, but it was very early computer technology to put a chart on a registered chart table and link it to the ops room. So having registered the chart, you would then have apply fixes to the chart, drive a dot to position, and that would be passed into combat systems. So it was our earliest ability to digitally pass the information to the combat system directly. Um, and just look at the cost, each item costing £50,000 at the time. In yacht navigation, the parallel, of course, I wonder if anybody's still using them because it's a, a very valid device, was the Yeoman chart plotter. Very, very effective. And in that era, more sensors were coming in because the move from RDF, greater use of DECA, and a lot of the time during the 80s, I was using DECA as a navigation system both in the Navy and in yachts, uh, but equally GPS was coming in. And there, therein lies that risk that as soon as you have something telling you where you are to an extremely accurate position, people start to believe it too much and probably don't question it. So that's going to be one of the thrusts of what I talk about. Uh, Yeoman chart plotter, as I say, very effective, and there was that improved instrumentation. So we might get to this stage of uh, a much posher, more modern navigatorium, probably something like many of you are still using, yes. perhaps. <laughs> Although, of course, there are now even greater uh, proliferation of screens. So in the RN in that era, we'd started that process of registering a paper chart to a plotting table that would actually capture position. And also, uh, if you read through briefly, uh, that system, which I'll talk about a, bit, a little bit more, was tracking potentially 40 other contacts within that system. Uh, and it was a very, very basic 256K processor that was doing it, but was still very effective. So we went from an early version through that system, which was called the Ship's Navigation and Processing System, SNAPS, just uh, at that, carried on doing its duty right up to the time that we went down our, our fully digital route. <coughs> the biggest change we had was, rather than doing all training at sea, from classroom to sea, was actually starting to use bridge simulation. So HMS Dryad, and I'll talk about the locations shortly, was where we had our first bridge simulator. It did drive some thinking. We actually finally started to think, well, if you're looking where you're going, you ought to have the chart in that direction, rather than go behind the black curtain at night. And that, that brings another story in a minute. Um, HMS Somerset had that uh, forward-facing snaps table. It would have originally been back behind the rating there as the echo sounder reporter, but at least the person working on the chart or the navigator could stand behind the chart and do that situational appreciation to drive situational awareness from looking and collating information. A corollary and risk we'll talk about later is, once you've got an electronic screen doing it, whilst it might be facing forward, does it drag you into it and you tend to look at it too much and not correlate information? Even our submarines, we're using the same system, and that really is a, a critical aspect. A lot of the drive for what we wanted to use was for the submarine capability. That carries forward into when we went digital. We had to have the tools and systems and methods that would allow submarines to navigate when there is no sensor input. So uh, slightly darkened, but the keyboard display unit for the SNAP system is, is up there and accessible. Paper chart registered to the chart table. The problem for us occurred, and it often does. I was briefly talking to Runo about the problems that the Norwegian Navy has had more recently, was a ship that I oversaw the training for at FOST, very capable team, deploying on a worldwide deployment, um, and, and looking at the date, and you know, this happened in July 2002, we're actually going to have a gathering in July this year um, to talk about Navy safety, where we've got to, were the lessons learned from this fully implemented? Um, have we done the right thing? It was very unfortunate. Dark of night, captain had been ashore, flying back to the ship by helicopter. 
the executive officer with temporary command, and a decision made to turn back towards the coast without realizing there were offline hazards. There was a junior officer, a midshipman on the chart. The chart was at a poor scale. There had been no advice about potentially changing to the next scale of chart, and he was only plotting a dead reckoning position. Actually, the dead reckoning position for 2102 obliterated a rock on that scale of chart. That was the rock that they struck at 2102. So it was an accurate dead reckoning position. But this caused a lot of inward gazing. Um, it led, um, it, it took a bit of time discussing what had gone wrong for the whole process of inquiry, the board of inquiry. Um, we ran a major navigation review in 2003. I was already a specialist navigator by this time, and as I say, I'd been at FOSS overseeing navigation training. We selected a group of people to look at this, and it made various recommendations. The key question is, did we leap too early into going down a digital navigation route? Should we have waited for more technical development? There was good software ready, and a software team ready to put the extra tools that we needed but ultimately we did end up with some very early hardware and perhaps not the right technical refresh process over the past 15 to 20 years. But we wanted to improve situational awareness because that was the key issue that caused the problem, <coughs> modernize the bridges and improve the input to combat system. And if I'm critical of anything, it was mentioned but not properly <coughs> looked at in the requirements document because, um, and I could be critical, of they're not still serving, but the Navy Board at the time said, yes, go digital to solve all these problems, but don't spend more than 20 million pounds. They wanted the whole Navy of nearly 60 ships at the time to go digital, but they hadn't envisaged how much it might cost. And we had to defer some aspects for the smaller ships and certainly aspects for the small craft, particularly for the Royal Marines, which are still uh, endemic problems that we're trying to solve. But we set up, we chose a software that was 70% of the way there for everything we needed, including the submarine navigation methodology. And we chose a hardware provider and we started fitting ships. Uh, and I was involved in directing some of the decisions about when we would switch all training to that digital system. Um, but it took, as you can see, you know, quite some time nine years before we then said, right, we're now going fully digital. Um, I've been back in the school, having done many other things. I was the OIC in the school up until about 2008, went off to do several other things, was in the Maritime Warfare Center, came back in 2015, and a year later, there was this declaration, go digital. One of the principles behind that, this no use of paper charts was, we'll save money on paper charts. How many of you constantly think, when can I afford to buy some new charts? Do I? Can I keep the old charts going? How damaged are they? How correct are they? Actually, one thing I forewarned, and now almost shout and scream about weekly, is having gone digital, we've had a massive increase in the use of A4 printing and use of printer cartridges <laughs> for people to process their information within a digital system, only to need then a reference book of what they've got. So there's, there's a, an endless cost of that that was never envisaged. It's not a joke, actually, um, and you have here in the Little Ship Club really nice framed charts of certain areas. Just for people to look at certain areas, we still take paper charts and put them on the bulkhead for people to look at certain areas. Um, but there are also, we're in the process of looking at routing charts for oceanic planning uh, for greater aspects. We're working with UKHO to say we want that for planning information also in the digital system. So we are there digital, but there's still some paper <coughs> around. Um, so the school location does, um, as I say, I can be slightly melancholic and nostalgic about the locations. Um, anybody who's been in the Navy will also uh, uh, feel that to an extent, but it, it sort of drove some of the process. Actually, when I look back, and I'm constantly having to talk about how long we used one system, we obviously, throughout time, right from Nelsonian time and before, taught people to be ship's officers who knew enough about navigation 
to take ships to places. There might have been mistakes on the way, there might have been groundings and loss of ship, but it was all about war fighting. It wasn't until 1906 that we really had a formal navigation training center. It had started initially with the Hulk ship HMS Mercury, a uh, former FARC. There's, there's a, there is often confusion because there was also training ship Mercury, the former HMS Gannett, which eventually became president for a while, but then was uh, pushed into uh, dereliction. But actually in Portsmouth, um, under uh, part of Jackie Fisher's time, Captain Henry Oliver drove the setting up of the first nav school in the old Naval Academy in Portsmouth Dockyard. Nobody's quite sure. I think one of the other supporting assets as a floating platform was referred to as dryad, hence the, the use of the term, and it drove the later change. The old Naval Academy is still there in the dockyard. It, it is an historic building. It does need some attention, uh, but it is there as a point of reference as the true alma mater for navigation training in the Navy. Um, but it, there was then a move, particularly in wartime during the Second World War, to an establishment that became called HMS Dryad at Southwark Park, Southwark House, over the hill, beyond Portsdown Hill, for a degree of protection. Um, and there is Southwark House. Um, when we eventually moved from there, the D-Day landings were planned from there, and there was the war map room, which can still be visited. Um, the Navy eventually moved from there and said, we'll only move if it doesn't remain a defence establishment. Guess what? We've moved, and it is still a defence training establishment. It is the Tri-Service Police Training College now. So, uh, at an interim phase, though, <coughs> the school moved to a unit, actually called HMS Mercury up in the South Downs, and that was where I cut my teeth in navigation training, uh, and this is the nostalgic loss, because it was out of the country, driving around in sports cars whilst learning training, <laughs> a very ornate house, um, which is now a housing development, it's having two gone. The blue arrow at the side uh, takes us off to the north, um, and the buildings are no longer there because they were just huts. The nav school that I knew was through this fence uh, through the 80s into the, into the 90s. Um, and I often drive along there to Old Winchester Hill just to reminisce. The next move took us back to Dryad. Um, and this was where I was first uh, becoming a specialist navigator, working there on the staff. And it was where, as you saw earlier, where we had this the first build of a bridge simulator that look at how you can put people in a training unit, get them to use all the tools that you want them to use for the ability to stop, rewind the training, relearn the lesson, revisit if anything goes wrong before sending people to sea. And it was very successful. Dry it itself, um, I, haven't, I could have gone back in there to get a better picture. This is taken from a YouTube video of a training film at the time. That main block is Oliver Block, named after Captain Henry Oliver. Um, but a, a clip from Navy News of June 1996 that showed that move, and this was a, yet again required thinking about digital systems to represent what you were doing, but we were still using paper charts. But it was the, the start of thinking about what will we do next, will we move into digital systems? And indeed, we had already taken some ECDIS systems to see to see what they might be able to do for us. Um, I do go up to drive relatively frequently. As I said, I haven't been in to take a picture of Oliver Block. This is taken through the fence. That is the Amethyst Training Building. Actually, as uh, talking to some of you, I mentioned how much I kayak. One of my kayak stores is still in the 2-2 Range Building at Dryad, so I do have to go there relatively frequently. The final move to where we are now was in 2001. The whole of maritime warfare training, the maritime warfare school, was moving stage by stage from Dryad to Collingwood. Formerly, post-war, a weapon engineering establishment looking at use of sonar, radar, and digital systems. It was a decision made to corral all of warfare type training in one location. It gave us that opportunity to renew and expand bridge simulator training. And so a new unit was built, which is our current school, uh, named Endeavour after Captain Cook's ship uh, to bring the spirit of navigation. Um, just to uh, direct, if anybody doesn't know, 
Portsmouth here, Portsmouth Naval Base, the Gosport side of, of the uh, Portsmouth Harbour, Collingwood just on the edge of Fairham, and the NTU are building there. We do retain some historical links. Um, indeed, that binnacle that we have in the foyer is not unlike the one at the D-Day ship at the start on the gun direction platform. And there is a slight museum display in, in the inner foyer, including Captain Oliver's sextants and parallel rulers and a number of other instruments. And um, our 70s to 80s radar. So we can show people when they're using an electronic aid radar, how it used to be done with a chinograph pencil on a plotter. Um, a lot of those images, um, I, I did source the ND Association, the Navigation and Direction Officers Association, has a website which has some of the information. As I said, there was a YouTube video there uh, with that screenshot of Oliver Block, uh, but a lot of uh, personal images that I've created. So you might be asking, why is that important? It's important because it was those stepping stones to having what we term full mission bridge simulators. Our building is built around the two units. They are back to back on the control room that runs the facility. And we can do all of that. Any, uh, we've got a database of certain areas which we can expand. We were doing some work earlier today to look at a request for an organization that wants a different area. And the critical thing is that we have a team to run it. Um, so whereas previously naval training might have been 0800 to 1600, um, we're at, oh, my building is open until 2300. So I have a watch team who can run that simulator for visiting ships to come in and do their training. Actually, what that has demonstrated and we're articulating at the moment, when we make the next stage of renewing this facility, we probably need four simulators, mm -hmm. and we might go away from that evening use. But uh, it's, it's an argument to make about the comparable cost of people working late, not having recovery time, against doubling the number of simulators. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is where we run all of our navigation training, and it is where we took ourselves down this training route into the digital navigation system. So I mentioned the areas, we've got all primary naval ports, all training areas and frequently used operational areas, and all the classes that we need. We, we deferred on having Scott as a one-off ship. Um, it has changed slightly. Um, there was training going on, but this still shows the format, exiting Portsmouth Harbour, the layout with the captain's chair, and still critically, so here's the thing, even when we went digital, um, and it is our wet this unit here and one aft to be used like a chart table, we retain the Polaris for visual bearing taking because we are reliant upon that source and we train everybody to be doing this in pilotage to not be reliant upon the GPS, GNSS sensors. Um, there is a process ongoing. Everything needs technical refresh. We would have wanted it earlier um, and I'm fighting to say it should be happening now to get the new simulators, but we might have to go through another cycle. Um, and intriguingly, with the scale of that, just with two bridges, with the sub radar systems, with the WECDIS in there, it is actually run by 66 PCs networked together in different control aspects, I and mean, through what the control room can do, uh, which is quite an expensive buy if we're only doing it for three years before then replacing all the simulators. With new ship builds, hydrodynamic models have to be purchased to be put in there so we can carry on with training for new ship classes. So that sort of takes us into how we went digital, the training management system that we have and how we deliver all of our training. This is where I mentioned Maritime Warfare School, as was a Dryad, moved to HMS Collingwood, or still named the Maritime Warfare School. Essentially, it's not anymore. Um, over the past, through the COVID era, um, on a change, we've had contractor support to training since 2001, since the Maritime Warfare School moved there. It's changed company by company, uh, through most recently, Bangkok Maritime Training Limited, and, and finally, on the need to look to the future and do something better for longer, it was put out to tender 
not just for Collingwood to change, but all naval training establishments are now under this consortium, the Fisher Consortium, with, and I almost use the term, a battle staff for training management, the training management group at the headquarters. Um, we're just past, it started on 1st of April. It was a lot of the same people, but because it's quite a different management system and a number of people with, who haven't had the oversight of the individual units, there's still a lot of learning going on, people not understanding exactly what is delivered in each area. Um, but always since the Maritime Warfare School moved to Collingwood, there have been three primary training groups with navigation and partnered to all international training, where we, we do international navigation training within what is termed the Warfare Support Training Group. And I'm also the second in command of that training group. So that's one of the things that makes me quite busy as well as running all that training and other lodger units. So we'll continue in that framework under Fisher. We are quite specific to ensure that we retain all of our standards and the specifics of training and assessment that we do about what each post. So my post requires somebody who has been in a capital ship as a navigation officer, is command qualified and has command experience. And I run the nav training element, the initial warfare training element, and R&R &R, uh, maritime trade operations as well. Uh, and teach when we have the command courses coming through the navigation modules for them. And I'm one of the key assessors for all courses. My assistant in this, I have a lead for the navigation part of it. I also have a lead for the IGO training part of it um, and a more junior lead for the maritime trade operations. The critical aspect is that we only have five course assessors. Quite often in the schedule, the constancy of throughput, we will have three overlapped courses and barely enough capacity for assessment. Uh, and that's something we're working with the new training group to try and resolve. The senior course, um, and I was delivering the senior course from 2015 until 2020 and redesigning it, that's what we want our senior navigators to be. Uh, and particularly I'll, I'll focus on being an instructor, being a very experienced, qualified, knowledgeable instructor to guide all of the processes. In talking about digital systems, and I've alluded to the fact that we are not reliant upon sensors, being position, navigation and time, PNT specialists, and starting to learn more and more about how equipment works. As we've gone into this technical era, um, I'm not saying we're weapon engineers, but we need people to know a lot more about technical systems. And indeed to then be able to run task groups and be on a battle staff for overarching navigation warfare aspects. Um, that senior course is delivered for me by another senior instructor, also captain ship experience and command qualified, by one civilian instructor who is an ex RN spec N, and he's the assistant instructor at sea, and another civilian instructor, and this chap is ex Royal Fleet Auxiliary, who concentrates on delivering the astro and tides. And we have focused on improving and increasing the amount of astro that is given. It's, I'm not saying it's degraded, but it was given a lighter touch than it used to be. Um, for that course, they are assessed by the fleet navigating officer from headquarters. But as changes and transformation have occurred, his time is increasingly under duress, and we may have to look at how that is achieved for the future. Um, they still get a significant sea phase. They're going to build up in the simulator, and then two weeks at sea. Critically, it's exclusion of sensors, sensors, no use of GNSS, no GPS, and everything they do, unless it's absolutely critical to give them almost a one sweep only, no use of radar. Everything to be done by visual, by depth, and by stopwatch, effectively. And, as we'll see when I run the videos at the end, inclusion of use of sextant for horizontal sextant angle and visual and vertical sextant angle. So a whole load of core specialist techniques, I call them specialists, they are basic techniques, but to do them at speed, work out where you are and tell the task group where to be. Unfortunately, we can't take additional ships to sea as we used to, so they have ghost 
uh, task group ships with them. Up until 2020, we were doing this in Type 23 frigates at speeds of up to 24 knots. Um, with the front leaning, forward deployed nature of those ships, fewer and fewer are available. We'll run through a little bit of what they do. There is uh, uh, St. Albans passing under Kyle Aiken Sky Bridge. And the run down through Kyle Rear. This is on our digital system, so you can start to see the methodology we apply is the same as we used to use in paper charts. There's a limiting danger line construct, not just potential clearing bearings to be referred to, but clearing depth as an alternative it is, if it is difficult to have a visual bearing construct. Um, and the view from the bridge at that time was the tidal stream took us south at about two and a half, three knots. Um, into confined areas as well, again, using all the same methodology. That's within Lock U, a very famous area for the sea mounting of the Mansk convoys, of course, and still a valid training area. Critically, though, I'll step back to where I said submarine techniques. Once submerged with no sensors, submariners have always used the technique of pool of errors, and pool of errors expansion for the error in trap keeping, the error in speed, and allowed a bubble of space to grow around you until that bubble gets close to a hazard, then you need a piece of information, potentially one ping on the echo sounder or risk going to surface and more visual bearing. This was one of the key tools we had to put into our digital system to allow submarines to navigate. Now we use it on the surface to deal with that denial of GPS potentially in any conflict. In this instance, um, the estimated position of the ship is here. The bubble is there, and we've selected a depth area, and we're waiting for an echo sounder confirmation of which area we might be in. The next stage, having got a depth reading, we can cut off the shallower depth from the depth we've indicated, which cuts back the bubble to a smaller area. If you take a visual bearing, you obviously get a slim slice of that, so you can get even greater reduction, but it's not too important to reduce it. This starts to get you thinking differently. GPS makes you think, I'm here to 10 meters. This means, well, I know I might be somewhere in this bubble. And as long as I drive that bubble and I don't push any other units too far away from that bubble towards hazards, it's fine. Uh, a couple of other pictures of coming in towards an anchorage off the coast of Northern Ireland during the course. And I mentioned the use of special bearing pairs. So here, um, within Loose Bay, uh, just off the Mull of Galloway. Um, there are a couple of offline rocks that are visible, which allows you to run and take visual bearings, relative bearing measurement, and particular special bearing pairs to establish a position. The, taking these senior navigators of the Navy, this is what we're trying to get them to do. To be ready for war fighting in challenging circumstances, with loss of sensors, or you know, for non-detection, you might choose to have the radars off. The GPS will probably have been taken away. But it's starting to think, whilst we're building individuals' capability, capacity, and flexibility, it's looking at how we optimize their individual situational awareness to help improve the unit and or task group's situational appreciation. Obviously, they've got to keep it safe, we want to see how they start to relate to a senior officer in telling him how they're running this task group and also how they might learn to guide and mentor others. Below that, and having said, you know, this is something I've done in the past, my core instructors have done this course over the years, one of the core courses we run is the Fleet Unit Navigation Officers course. Um, and they will go, as it says there, to any of the fleet units, so it might be a submarine, they have RFA officers as well, uh, and we run it as a set course, giving them all the same techniques. Um, the course is primarily run by one of my spec ends. They're assisted by a submariner who can start to guide the detailed thinking about that pool of errors method and concentrate specifically when we have submariners on that course. They get a practical phase. They go and literally uh, this week, they're in their simulator week, Next week, they will go to sea, uh, the current course, 
uh, and I will take one other officer to go and assess them. Again, they have to do this without GNSS, but we do allow them to use radar to back up their planning. Um, the thing that changed in July 2020, um, to be able to forward deploy more frigates, uh, we did raise uh, an additional OPB that was going to be decommissioned, and it has been made on that training ship platform. It takes away the ultimate use of speed there. We can do higher speed runs in the simulator when we're doing the spec end course, but it's sufficient for all our purposes. Uh, and the uh, container unit, the ISO container on the uh, aft deck is the nav classroom that is uh, that's, uh, plugged on. So they did get thrown around a little bit in that, but that's, uh, that's what we use. Um, and, sorry, it's not forwarding. More recently, she was given uh, to commemorate and replicate one of the wartime hazard paint schemes she was given uh, at that stage, the nav classroom hadn't been put back on. I've indicated that we're talking about using terrestrial tools to do all of what we want to do most of the time. Within our software that we're using, that you know, we went out there in 2004 to look at what was there. It was a Canadian company that already started to look at some of this for the Canadian Navy, and they had to develop further the concept of the submarine tools. But this is our fixing menu. When you pull up to put a fix in the system, you get a choice of whether you're going to go visual bearing, radar, sounding, depth contour, vertical section and angle, horizontal section and angle, transit, um, or uh, and the extra box, that's the number we've got, back to another visual. Equally, um, you can, each one has to be referred to by a reference point name, uh, and you can, if you're giving bearings, use true or relative. So that's what gives us the strengths of how we put information into the system in the images you saw earlier from the spec end course. Below that fleet course, we train um, slightly younger officers in a preliminary course to potentially be mine clearance vessel uh, navigators and also watch one in fleet groups as a supporting element to have a second officer who has navigation training and that also applies to those who drive P2000s or the Ernus. Um, slightly lower level of qualification for the instructors, uh, they are at the fleet unit level so they are guided by the specialists within the unit um, this is something that we are looking at at the moment, a few years ago, um, that there used to be a sea phase for them at the moment. Their only practical training is in the simulator. Uh, the number of people we're trying to get through would preclude adding a week at the moment, but we're looking at whether it is a valid uh, aspect to include. Um, I also mentioned taking people up ready to then become navigators. They are warfare officers in the Navy. Um, I've got another team that are doing all of that initial warfare officer training for me. Um, there's the sort of student throughput per year. Uh, their stream is on four different phases, part of which is at Dartmouth, then coming to us for three different phases interspersed by sea training. And with, and with the core team, the civilian astro and tides instructor has great influence on them as well, with three core course officers. Um, we're looking um, at something we did two years ago, was bringing in an additional staff officer uh, with the variety of locations that these people might go to for their training. We have an individual who is tracking up to 230 officers under training in the fleet with where they've been, what they've achieved, where they might need to go. So a degree of career HR management rather than specific um, uh, progression. It, it's, it's a progression path to the assessment phase. The next aspect, and we went down this route from 99, was that we became STCW 95 uh, compliant. So they get <coughs> tickets that are recognized by the Maritime Coast Guard Agency, and we're looking at improving that process. Um, so, as I say, we did it in 99, an initial MOU, uh, and further updates, and we're looking at how we take that forward for further recognition and further qualification. That is a statement from defense, and that's still valid. Obviously, there might be some aspects of equipment fitted or methods that we're going to use at times, particularly if we ended up in conflict. We do our utmost to be compliant as, as far as reasonable and practical. 
Um, so that process, when these people have been through their period at sea, learning their watchkeeping skills, so they'll have an initial phase at sea, come to us for their core training, back to sea in a specialist time, getting bridge time, uh, guided by the ship's team. They'll come back to us for a build-up week into an assessment week. And they, their first now watch certificate, we award them in the bridge simulator. The process we take them through looks at how they are driving the ship in different circumstances, and the MCA have seen what we do and how we assess and agreed that it is best practice. They then go to a ship for the CO to build them towards their warfare knowledge, and that's called the bridge warfare qualification. The other process we run is, is the command assessments, where we have a number of scenarios in the simulator that allow us to assess people for command. And again, the MCA have, have seen that and like the process. The follow-on then is a tactical type scenario, again using the bridge simulator to see people's immediacy of decision-making. Um, and our assessing staff, including me, advise the senior officers who come to look at that process. And unfortunately, it's almost that critical decision um, hopefully as seafarers amongst you, if you think back to the cruel sea, that decision of, do I attack the submarine by driving through the men in the water? That might require a moral decision. Um, if you were in a war fighting scenario, you need the ability to weigh up the risks and the impact on ship or people in the water. Probably a worst example, but a sort of critical decision there. Um, that's the sort of assessment we give them. Coastal navigation, traffic separation scheme, night approach to coast to a pilot station, coastal navigation with restricted visibility coming in, and then pilotage on Friday. And all of these guys have to do those runs. We will start them with GPS available and then take <coughs> GPS available to sh so that they can prove they can use that software with GPS denial. Um, so that's the staff I have to achieve this. Um, seems quite large, but all of that overlay training, um, including the maintenance team, I've highlighted in red those that are, are my assessors. Ideally, I would like to have somebody else who can assess because of the loading at times um, and helping guide the ship's teams when they come in. Um, so I often think it's like a small ship's team uh, that I oversee, but intriguingly, with no senior ratings for anybody that has been in the military or the Navy. Um, a handful of junior rates in, in the margin just to steer the simulator, but very officer heavy, effectively. So there comes that question. I've, I've alluded to it. What we're trying to do is make sure that people can do without GPS, without sensors potentially, and at the highest level without radar, using basic systems to pull in an individual who is in an important position to make that safe navigation decision for the command in any situation. Um, there's an aspect uh, going back to uh, Korea and aviation in Vietnam, Colonel John Boyd um, came up with a concept of the OODA loop, it's now used in business. Um, in a way it was meant to be simplistic for a, a dogfight. So perhaps it's been overanalyzed. There are other models that we use to talk about situational awareness. Um, you know, the OODA loop has been uh, analyzed into this uh, with feedback loops, so an observed phase with many different inputs. Orientation, which takes account of many different uh, facets and aspects, into do you have enough to make a decision, which might go back around the loop to see if the decision is correct. Um, before you then take action and test. We teach the specialist navigators aspects of this to get them thinking about situational awareness. At the basic level, and sitting in an ops room, we also say you know, some people just think in layers of information. So you might have different subjects, different layers. Can you, in the way you display your information, go to a single layer, then see how they're overlaid and how they impact on each other? Um, my personal preference that I've studied to a great extent um, and used for operational planning uses, uh, and this lady was uh, the, for the US uh, Department of Defense, was a lead on situational awareness analysis. 
and she talked about a perception phase before achieving comprehension and then projecting. And that might be a process for each individual bit of data you've got or each individual contact you're looking at or you know, a location. So she refers to three stages of building situational awareness. And sometimes I try and talk about almost a, in a three-dimensional sort of quarter of a cube diagram. Um, this sort of relates to the OODA loop. Uh, taking that forward, um, I sometimes prefer to use these terms um, of that process of monitoring, assessing, analyzing at the same time, so that initial analysis before projecting and deciding and acting. So we get people to think and analyze how they think. If you look online um, on Wikipedia, uh, there's a lot of Abbey Kerenzi's thinking, and that's the model that she presents of that perception, comprehensive projection into decision and performance of action. Not moving forward. So I would say that whether you're on your large yacht, uh, taking an example of a Hull Boat Racing 50 there, where you start to get your digital system, three systems on the upper deck there, how many below, is there a risk that you're going to become too reliant on GPS telling you where you are? Actually, in that situation, you've got that ability to look around, correlate where the boys are. Does it look right? Has there been any disruption to GPS? What else am I going to look at? Reading the tidal stream off boys, looking at what the wind's doing. Um, there was mention of open bridges at the start. I often find with the junior officers today, they even fail to recognize and look at the sea to know the wind direction. Mm -hmm. Often I have to tell them, step out onto the bridge wing and experience the circumstances. If you're telling people they can go onto the upper deck, make sure you're aware of what it feels like on the upper deck. In a Type 45 destroyer, and this was really the first move forward into real modern bridges, but we had to fight with the providers to get the digital navigation system we wanted in there, because the contractor had already made a decision. Um, and in our OPVs like HV7, it's a relatively modern bridge, but on, on a simpler base, still reliant upon having the Pagoras. Um, but I've also applied it in many other circumstances. In 2019, um, we took a group, some of them recovering injured servicemen, Royal Marines, to follow the route of Blondie Hasler's attack um, on Bordeaux in the River Gironde. Um, and whilst we had some safety boats, sea kayaks who had GPS, we tried to do it as realistically as possible, marking and counting and, and assessing the speed we were going at, marking on the coast, using a map, um, a lot of time just on red lighting, but here we were just about to go down through a narrow cut with a sea wall and potential impingement uh, uh, of craft running up against the wall by flow of water at about five knots. So critically assessing how far we had to run before we could get into a single line. Any situation. This moves us towards questions, but if we can run the videos before people start uh, pooling questions. I've mentioned about use of sextant. Uh, these videos come from one of the specialist okay, on. Uh, on one of the specialist navigation courses that I I ran a couple of years ago, where we take our course, so Ramsey Sound, Bardsey Island, uh, through the run, where there's the uh, spiny needle rocks, um, a significant tidal stream and heaped up flow. We're taking, at this stage, we take seven there now, a Type 23 frigate, through this run, against four to five knots of tidal stream, um, and all being done using that methodology. That would run for a certain time until we're through the wave period. The next one showed it the sextant use, so if we probably run and shift to the next one, please, Nick. So, use of the sextant, it's not just about astro. Here, we've not only taken away the bearing measurement device. They've got no longer any reference to gyro. Somewhere in the ship there will be a heading, 
and we can start doing relative bearing from the uh, jack staff well, as accurate as possible by sextant, horizontal sextant angle to count our way through this run um, and it's literally an angular measurement, cued down to the next bearing and the navigator here driving the route and in between, I can't remember at which point he says it, in comparison to what the log's showing, looking at water speed by predicted tidal stream, And as we get towards the wheel over, that was three cables to run just before. He's got to pass out the instructions with tactical signaling to the yeoman. And pass an instruction to the other ships in the ghost. And also, navigate And so, if we switch to the next one, it shows where we pushed him a stage further and his, his team are now using two horizontal sextant angles for the final aspect of that pilotage. And you have to navigate to ships from the OCS by the ship on will start with zero zero one. So driving the formation, the tactical <laughs> signaling that could potentially be sent by flag or be on low grade, short range comms if we don't want to make a transmission. That's probably sufficient to show the methodology. Thank you, Nick. So, questions? <laughs> okay, um, so I'll just ask a question first. Um, You've uh, sort of stepped through what's been happening in the last 60 years, yes. both in terms of uh, you know, sort of training protocols and technology. With advancing is in technology, which are galloping along. What do you think will happen in the next 10 years? So that's the problem, and I alluded to the fact, did we go too early? We had a software that we're still using that does everything we wanted to. <clears throat> the first tranche of hardware that it was run on um, needed technical refresh and hadn't been considered in terms of funding path. So there have been delays, it, it actually, we had to make solid decisions about certain platforms not getting the capability at a certain time. And that technical pace is only changing. We were talking before the presentation um, to a number of people. Electronic charting is critical to this. The information there, having the depth information, and all international hydrographic offices are about to make that step change from the first version of an electronic navigation chart, the S57, to an S100, which will have even more embedded information. So it will need to do more data processing. So the, you've almost, you can't second guess how quickly technology will change, but you've almost got to try and persuade, and you know, I'm in the game of having to try and persuade MOD to do this. Anybody in a personal craft will have to look at how much should I spend to have something that is going to be capable for a set time? And I, I think, unfortunately, it will be changing so quickly, you'll have to accept that you can't buy a solution that's going to last a long time if you want the best system. And, and we're just at that stage now of talking about, effectively, we've done WEPDIS-1 for the RN. Um, can our current providers add more? Uh, and one of the things we want to look at is the user interface almost to drive that achievement of situational awareness, quicken the achievement of it by better presentation of information. For all that we do with the system, there are a lot of tools in there and a lot of sub-menus that you have to learn. Actually, one improvement we want to make is easier access. If you're doing one process, one button that takes you over to certain menus so you don't get lost in the menu structure. Um, but it's it's almost second guessing that rate of change and having to spend up front to commit but recognizing you might have to update soon. Okay, thank you. I think we've got a question from our remote audience on YouTube. There's a question from Simon Jackson. How does the Royal Navy cope with navigating in the significant number of areas where there are no or inadequate ENCs and no or inadequate raster electronic charts? So. That was a problem looking at chart coverage. 
Um, so originally when we went down the wetness route, we knew there were still quite a number of areas with no ENCs. And we accepted that in those areas we would use raster charts. And through the analysis of the international hydrographic offices, and um, particularly UKHO, we knew where those areas were. We could ask, is it possible to create a product? Actually, the Navy also recognized that most of those problem areas were not areas we would go to. So it might be a problem more for the smaller craft that is going to have to cope with that. But we are reliably told that the percentage has only increased. There is that greater coverage now. I'd perhaps spin that into another test case that we have to run to prove what our software will do. Um, and I can't guarantee that ECDIS systems might have caught up with this now. Um, but a lot of the commercial ECDIS, when we chose our system in 2005, did not properly represent the international date line. So you could be navigating and find that your representation of date and time would be wrong on the system. We had to make sure that the convoluted path through the parts of the Pacific was properly recognized. And equally, um, uh, we have submarines that go to awkward places, including under the polar ice cap. We had to make sure that they could do polar navigation, whereas no normal ECDIS will cope with that. And even the experts who were working with us, who were confident they had a system, um, hadn't conceived the computerized model of the three-dimensional Earth because we were simulating a craft going to the North Pole under the ice. Um, when that simulated craft on the, simula on the chart display got to the North Pole, it disappeared. <laughs> it reappeared at the South Pole because the computer construct for that line of longitude was a half great circle. And the computer thought, I've got to that end of the line, I must be at the other end of the line. <laughs> so they had to write another coded bit of software there to get the two lines joined together. Okay, thank you. Um, questions on the floor? Uh, really, really. Yeah. Um, how do you teach your navigators to deal with a situation where the facts around you doesn't map your image in your head? Yes. Can you just repeat that question? So, um, asking about if the facts that you're seeing, the information is not making sense. Um, I mean, that's the critical stage that in the training we do, particularly in the simulator, we drive them to use the planning methodology. And one of our core drills is, if it's not making sense, you have got to tell, don't believe you're going to get it right and that it's going to work. Even if you need to get somewhere, that has to be the safety drill of, am I still immediately safe? Is there enough depth? I will have to stop the ship. But an analysis of, if I've lost my head mark, have I got a different mark that's giving me a clearing bearing? Is the depth making sense? But a recommendation gone, we need to stop the ship and re-establish position. Um, and that's critically through those stages of, of navigation where we would expect, with experience, people to be able to cope with less and less information to be able to make that critical decision. And it's almost where that running that pool of errors tool will help because you'll get that advance warning of that bubble expanding and being close to a hazard. But it's, it's a key part of how we train them is to recognize when they can't say where they are. Does that help? Yes. Uh, yes, one more question there. Do you have any links in with the rather more junior services? Um, the Army and the so, RF in their <laughs> navigation? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you said, Juno. Actually, it's one of the things through, and I, and I committed to do a lot of work for the Royal Institute of Navigation. We have, uh, for a very long time, had ex officio positions on the Council of uh, Royal Institute of Navigation. Um, I joined to do work with them even when there was somebody else representing the Navy, because at that stage I thought I was going to leave and do other work. There should be an Army member and an RAF member. Uh, that is one external school where we are we are trying to pull in. We definitely have connections, particularly through aviation navigation, because of course we do aviation. So we are strongly linked to the RAF in a number of areas with their aero systems, ports, etc. Uh, and we have tried to talk more frequently to the Army. They, they have, and, and almost through our Ministry of Defence review of the problem of over-reliance on GPS systems, 
We do have a regular symposium every year where we make sure everybody is aware of the problem and it's then a, an opportunity to talk to Army and RAF colleagues about how they might work. And I'll, I'll link that to, as well to having been involved in a lot of amphibious capability, obviously part of that, it might be Royal Marine or it might be land forces uh, from various different army units. We, we've often been involved in operations where we are coming from the sea to land in an area and so we're closely linked in looking at those sort of activities as well. Any more questions on the Any more questions? Um, I'll just take this opportunity to just mention about YouTube. I mean, <clears throat> this, rec this is being recorded, it will be available later, uh, for should anyone wish to see it again. And just to ask anybody who watches it on YouTube, including the people who are watching now, um, if you could um, like and uh, subscribe to this presentation, we <laughs> would uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, one thing now is I'll ask um, Paul Grimes to Hi, yes. say a few <coughs> words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a, a couple of announcements to make. First of all, I'd obviously like to uh, thank uh, the Little Ship Club and uh, Adam for this this uh, talk. Um, as most of the people in the room uh, will know, that RIN organises uh, one talk for you. Uh, each year, and I hope you've enjoyed this. And yes. uh, we tend to have navigation-focused uh, talks and, and subjects, so uh, I hope we'll be able to be, be invited to uh, arrange another speaker for you next year. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just uh, got a couple of other announcements that I'd, I'd like to make if, if uh, you've got time. Um, in uh, not quite two weeks' time, on the 29th, Saturday the 29th, we'll be hosting, uh, uh, running uh, our next electronic navigation conference uh, in the Royal Yacht Squadron in Cowes. Uh, this year, obviously, like quite a lot of other conferences, it's going to be a hybrid event. Uh, so if you would like to watch it online, uh, even if you can't attend in person, um, then you can uh, register in the, on the RIN website uh, to do that. Uh, so please have a look at the RIN website, Royal Institute of Navigation will, will find us uh, and uh, register if you'd like to uh, watch the event online or attend. Um, one of the things that we'll be announcing at uh, the conference is that uh, RIN uh, has been asked uh, by uh, the UK SOM uh, committee, which is sponsored by the MCA, uh, to look at whether uh, navigation systems on leisure vessels, small craft navigation systems, uh, could be recognised for navigation purposes. As most of you will realise, when you crank up your GPS plotter, you, you get a screen that warns you this device is not to be used for navigation. And there are a host of reasons why that is, is the case, but uh, clearly as in small craft we, we move towards paperless navigation and uh, there are a number of uh, people out there already who navigate completely without paper, uh, it's important to have systems that are properly recognised for navigation. So uh, I am chairing a working group which is uh, looking at coming up with a, a scheme to enable such systems uh, to be recognised for navigation. It's a, it's a UK-based committee at the moment, but one of the things that all of the chart manufacturers we've spoken to have said is that if it's going to work for them, it needs to be worldwide. So we do hope that uh, what we can do is uh, agree something with, by the, with the MCA and then take it to other bodies. And uh, we'll be talking about that briefly uh, at uh, the Electronic Navigation Conference in 10 days' time. So uh, if you'd like to join us there, please do. But once again, thank you very much to Adam. Thank, thank you very you. much to the Leadership Club. Okay, well, with that, we'll just. <laughs>